presence on the planet. That's what his award with the Walden New Thought Award is. So welcome to the stage, Kyle Cease. You're really going to love this. Thank you so much. Oh, folks, Reverend Coco Stewart, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. How about a hand for everyone who we just saw perform and speak? I'm just going to start out by just receiving that I'm here with you right now. Just receiving that I'm here. Do you feel the difference between receiving that you're here and chasing your approval? Can you feel that? Like, I hope you like me. There's a chasing that suddenly separates me from receiving the here that's always here. And if I'm starting to chase something, I'm actually saying I don't have, so I actually am unable to receive what is here right now if I'm going after something outside of myself. So I just receive that I'm here. I know that's hard to do. I watch you guys when you stand up, if you've, it's your first time here, and everyone does this, so they go, you know, welcome to a coffee, and just everyone, oh, I can't do it. I, oh. Oh, I'll pass this over here. I, I don't know what to do with this card. I just, anything but look at me. Don't look at me. I can't receive that you're loving me. Oh, oh I got to look like I'm really busy so I don't have to hear this. It's, that's what I say. I turn around. Everyone's like, oh. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. But I want to dare you in those moments to receive. It's scary, but it's only scary to what you're not. It's only scary to your old story. Whenever someone starts crying and they're scared, you only are releasing your prison. Did you know that? The only thing that's falling apart is your small story, your limitation, your prison, right? And if you can't receive love here, how can the universe get in there? How can, if you're actually, like the universe is like a bellhop waiting to take your bags for you. It's right next to you, like, do you want me to deal with this or not? And you're like, no, I'm going to fix it myself because in 1974, no one helped me, so I'm going to still not be helped. And the universe is like, I got this if you want it. Just let me take this. And you're like, mm, no, because my mom said that when I was a kid, and then I let her help me, and then she ruined everything, so no one can help me. No one help me. <sighs> People that come to my events and probably come to Agape are really good at giving but they're not great at receiving often, right? And you can only give at the level you receive. If I say, take, take a breath, and I ask you to actually think of the word receive when you breathe in. Just think of the word receive. Feel the word receive. And some of you might notice that's, some of you might notice that's a scary word to receive, right? Oh, I don't want to receive and have the attention be on me and actually receive. But if I say, now as you exhale, think of the word give. Ah, very easy. But you only could give out the amount of air that you breathed in. How much are you cutting yourself off from giving if you're not receiving? So for me to start this talk, however this is starting, I'm just receiving what an honor it is to be here. And I say at many events, uh, it's an honor to be here. And I actually mean it here. Um, uh, Most places I'm lying. I'm like, I don't want to be here at all. But this one, I love. This place is amazing. This is my second biggest, my second biggest place. The first one's here. Right? Right here. It's here. And I know that just saying my heart is my home can be a cliche. Like there's a restaurant called Cracker Barrel that probably has that written on a sign somewhere. My home is my heart. And that's a sentence that we can hear at one level, which is when you say it, and then I watch a lot of people nod and look at each other. Like home is my heart. Mm, 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 mm. Because that's in our spiritual community, right? The nodding. Mm, 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 mm. But inside we're like, (laughs) don't look at me and I don't want to actually look at my heart, but I'm going to nod to other people and we'll get connection about the concept that my heart is my home, but not actually fully live in the idea that your heart is actually your home. I mean, the only thing you actually are is this space right now. This space right here, this space is the actual star of this talk today. This space is who's talking. This space right here. When you see an entertainer, you see a performer, you see someone, that's cool. They're nowhere as cool as the space because the space is where they came from. So get excited about the space because this space is the only thing 
that actually creates the space where we came from. It's the space. And when you say, Kyle, when you say, I love this, a lot of questions come up because that's death to the small story that like to worry or have problems, right? So when I say that, people, when you say listen to the space, actually listen to the space. The way you can listen to someone else talking, this space is full of so much more information. This now space. Can you receive it? And when you receive it, the first thing that comes up is all the fear. If I listen to the space, my small story is going to come up. My story of limitation. That's the first thing the space has to do, is clear out what you're not. Because there's a ton of things you think you are that you're not. Like who I am is how much money I have or I don't have. Right? If who you are is someone who's broke, let me ask you something. If you made money, do you stop existing? No. So you can't say who I am is my current bank account. That's impossible. You can't say who I am is a millionaire because that could change and you'll still exist. You can't say who you are is your beliefs because your beliefs could change. If you've believed one thing fully and then you believed another thing, but you existed through both sets of beliefs, that means it's impossible that you're your beliefs. So anything you believe right now, let go of it because it's not true. Just this space, infinite possibility. You couldn't be your body because your body changed. I had a five-year-old's body, then I had a grown-up's body, then it got chubby, then it got skinny. If you've watched my history, it gets chubby and skinny and then weirdly buff for a while, back to skinny again. <laughs> and I, I'm currently working on a hybrid of all body styles right here. So you'll see I have some chubby, yet I'm kind of buff, like I got... Like, oh, wow, look at that arm. And then, where's his legs? There's no legs here. People look at me and go, what does he do at the gym? Is it just like, oh, does he just eat donuts and then bicep curl while he's doing it and treadmill through the process? What machine is that that manually feeds him something that he keeps on his waist, yet he's still bicep curling? So I have all of these different body types going on and they can change and I will still exist with my body changing one way or another so there's no way in my body. Anything you say, I am, and follow it with a word is a lie. Right? And that's where our pain is. The idea that that's who you are. So if you're this infinite being, if I say to you, you're an infinite being, can you feel the ego kick in and go, well, he doesn't know my story. Easy for him to say, <laughs> but my story is different. <laughs> And if you say, my story, where are you going? To your past, which doesn't exist. The only evidence you have of your story is your past, which doesn't exist, <laughs> right? So there's this filter that you see yourself through that includes your past that totally isn't real. And then the space can't get in unless you listen to the space. If you listen to the space, the space is going to clear that out. I know this because every morning I wake up and instead of doing the old habits of watching the news or hopping on Facebook or whatever, I just listen to silence. I wake up. Usually I do two hours. And people will say to me, how do you do two hours? I don't understand how you have time to do two hours of meditation. And I always say, I don't know how you have time to not. Because I wake up in the morning and think, I got to call this person, I got to call this person, and I got to call this person. Then I listen to silence for two hours, and I go, I totally don't have to call any of those people. <laughs> I don't have to call those people. <laughs> because quite a bit of those people I was going to call was my small story, worried that I needed to people-please my way to not lose their love the way I did when I was five, or that I was doing a should kind of thing, where I was like, I should do, my mom said, the public says, life says, I should call this person. It's kind of engaging to move from a what you should do. That's not even a thing. But when you clear out the lies, I listen to silence, I actually do it. This is getting on the treadmill. There's a level where you can come to agape and hear this and it feels really good in your head and then we don't actually do it. And that is kind of like going to the gym, having them explain to you how an elliptical machine works and then you hear that but don't get on it. And then you go back home and you tell everyone all about the elliptical machine that they should check out and you start becoming an elliptical machine coach and telling everyone, you got to start my elliptical machining. Meanwhile, we're sitting here spiritually not in that alignment. When you listen to silence, that's getting on the machine. Getting on the machine, right? When you listen to silence. So the first half an hour of every meditation, I call the breakup. 
It's the breakup of what I was yesterday. It's the fall apart of everything. So it's agony. And usually when we meditate for a few minutes, we have this painful experience. So we go, I can't meditate because I think the next few minutes is going to be like the first few minutes. So we break it and then we keep starting a first few minutes after we recondition ourselves to be in the ego of the world. So what would happen if you kept listening? Because every morning I sit up and I hear the thoughts. My mind shows up. I'll just be in silence. How long? An hour? You're going to do an hour? I can't do it. Who's talking? Like, who is that that just said that? I can't do an hour. This is stupid. This is a... I'm not doing anything. This is stupid. I'm not doing anything. And then another voice is like, well, we've done like six minutes. So if you have ten sets, that's six minutes. And you could do an hour... And then another voice, like, I gotta let the dog out. Like, this is... what am I gonna wear? Did I turn off the iron? Wait, I don't iron. I don't even have an iron. Why would I ask that? I haven't washed anything for three years. I should wash something. And I, <laughs> I should start a 90 day plan to wash clothes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna declare that to everybody. And then, then another voice, that's so stupid. Why would you say that? That's crazy. And then another, who's this? Who are you? Who are you? I don't know. And you just stay there. Now, if a voice shows up and goes, I can't do this, and I go, you're right, and I get up and go to Starbucks, I immediately declare that I'm run by the small story. The second the voice says, we can't do this, if you get up when it says that, immediately you just said, that's your God. That limited story, that small story. But if you keep listening, that story is going to get bored. You know why? Because you're being a space of love for it. This is how actual love works. Love really is the answer. So you keep listening, you're suddenly becoming the parent you've always wanted for the inner child, right? You're sitting here listening and this voice comes up and goes, I can't do this, this is stupid. And you just keep hearing it say that and you're not at war with it and you're not trying to fix it and you're not trying to figure out. There's way too much of us trying to figure out why stuff is coming up, but it doesn't need to be figured out. It's coming up because it's leaving. If you start figuring it out, you're going to make it stay because you're bringing your egoic significance into it. That's like going to the dentist and he's like, we're going to pull out your old cavity. And then he pulls it out and you see it because it's leaving. But it'd be weird if on the way you went, what does this mean? <laughs> like, oh, maybe my grandpa also had this feeling. And like, I, in a past life, I, I know I went to a past life person and they said that I was Alexander Graham Bell and that's why... <laughs> This filling's here. Oh, it's because I was seven once and had a filling. That's why, everybody, they can't get rid of it. The universe is just trying to take stuff from you. And the stuff that you need to know is already in your mind. And the stuff you don't need to know isn't. So when we're sitting here trying to figure out something, we're in denial of what we already know. And we're saying, I need to know what I've decided I need to know, not what the universe is telling me I need to know right now. Can you feel that? So if I'm just listening to silence, these voices come up and all these fears come up and I let them be there. I let them be there. I'm scared. I'm lost. Cool. I'm confused. Cool. By the way, do you know lost and confused is a very advanced place to be? (laughs) Because only your small story can be lost or confused. Think about this. Have you ever been in a car with someone who's totally lost but won't admit they're lost? They look like they know where they're going. (laughs) Ladies, have you ever had it when you're in a car with someone? (laughs) They don't admit they're lost. They're just like, we're fine. Everything's fine. I got it. And you've passed the same McDonald's nine times. (laughs) And you're like, why don't you just admit you're lost? I got it. I know what I'm doing. It's perfect. (laughs) Finally, when you go, okay, I'm lost, what happens? Well, let's type it in. Let's ask for directions. New information can come in now that you say you're lost. So take in the idea that if you're confused right now or you're lost, you're doing really well, right? 
Because only your small story can be lost. And sometimes I'll work with someone and they'll say, I gotta, I'll say something about the vastness of what they are and they'll go, I gotta wrap my mind around that. Stop it. How are you going to wrap the smallness of your story around the infinite vastness of what you are? Stop trying to shove it into your teeny suitcase and throw out the suitcase and enter the infinite vastness of what you are. Right? I got I to wrap my mind around it. I got to make it make sense to everything I've seen before this moment. So really, I can't have the breakthrough because it has to look like what I've seen before. There's a breakthrough trying to happen for you right now, but your figuring out is getting in the way of it. So as I listen to silence, the voice comes up. I'm a little worried. I don't know what I'm doing. Eventually, it's quiet. It has to eventually be quiet because only you're fighting it is what makes it alive. It's what keeps it alive. So after an hour, so after a half an hour, that's the breakup. After 30 minutes, I'm single, right? (laughs) I just broke up with the old story. I just let go of my old story. I just let go of what I'm not. And it's very scary, Boberry, because you think you are the old story which would be like going to the bathroom and thinking you're the stuff that you're about to let go of. (laughs) Wouldn't that be crazy? If you're like, I can't let go of this because in 1974, you're like, wait, hold on. (laughs) You're not that. You're the space it's coming from. You're the butt. (laughs) It's trying to leave. And your job is to be a space to let it come out. And it is impossible to listen to the space and not have that released. And the same way as going to the bathroom and meditating, the only thing you have to do is sit and wait. (laughs) Just sit and wait. Life will remove everything that no longer serves you in both scenarios. So at a half an hour... You're at a half an hour, now you're single. So my mind's clubbing and like, yeah, hey, want to go out and failing. And then 45 minutes to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, my soulmate shows up. Because now that I've cleared out my old story, I'm so much more receptive to this moment because this moment's not clouded by the smallness and my addiction to my small story. I'm able to be receptive in this moment. So at 45 minutes, every, it's actually on the nose almost every meditation I have. 46 minutes in, if you don't break it, a million dollar idea shows up. Nothing but love shows up. Infinite forgiveness shows up. Just full worthiness that you already are because you're not seeking it through the smallness of your past story. Right? You're just worthiness. There's a thing that people do, like, I got to find my purpose. Do you know how insulting that is to the universe for you to think you're not in purpose right now? For you to think you're not in purpose when you're in your hard times, for you to think you're... I have a really good friend who walks into a room and every time she does, the whole room lights up and then she'll come and hang with me later. She's like, I got to figure out my purpose. I got to figure out... I'm like, you don't think that had a purpose? You don't think when you did that, that had a purpose? Or are you measuring your purpose based on how you get paid? Are you measuring your purpose based on do I get love? Well, how are you measuring purpose and how insulting is it to something that created you as is to say I'm not in purpose unless I egoically find it? You are purpose. You can't get out of it. You are love. You can't get out of it. You can trick yourself into thinking you're not, but you can also close your eyes and you think there's no lights on you, but that doesn't mean they're not happening. There's lights in here. Whether you close your eyes or not, There's light aiming at you, but you can totally go, well, all my friends have their eyes closed, so (laughs) let's talk about how hard life is because I get connection to you because you feel kind of like my dad, and that's the only thing I associate to love. And then there's this deeper possibility that's trying to unfold every time you have what you call a problem. It's only a problem to your small story. There's no such thing as a problem, but there is a problem to your small story, and life is trying to get you to learn how to unconditionally love your circumstances. And it's so cool because you can't trick the universe. Most people try to love a problem so it'll leave, which really isn't love. If you try to love your kids so they leave, they're going to be, they're going to catch it. Right? <laughs> The universe is like, no, I'm teaching you actual unconditional love. So when I wake up, I listen to silence, and then I hear and realize if all those other stories aren't me, I have to be this space right now for real. And often people say to me after talks, that's great, Kyle, but what about the real world? (laughs) Like, I hear you, Kyle, that's great and all. That's never not been followed by, here's my problem, though. Right? That's great and all. No one's ever said, that's great and all. Bye. No, they go, 
<laughs> Isn't that weird how much we always mean the opposite of what we say? Like, no offense is usually followed by pretty offensive things. <laughs> Very few people have said, no offense, but nice hat. Like, that doesn't happen. Because that actually means no offense. But people say to me, Kyle, what about the real world? And I go, tell me about the real world. And I learned that the real world is, world is when you go home and you sit on your couch and you worry about all kinds of things that could happen one day that aren't actually happening. Where you click on the news and it specifically picks and chooses the worst stories that are going on and creates the illusion to you that the world is totally falling apart when all you have to do is walk down the street and see pretty much everything's okay. Right? That's the real world. You know, the real world, where even though I'm an infinite creative being that's worth billions of dollars, I'm going to do everything I can to stay in the small story because I'm scared to lose my mom's connection and be in a small, not fulfilling job and in an out of an alignment relationship. Everything I'm not, I want to be, in, that's realistic to me, even though right here is the space. The real world to most people is the most delusional world I've ever seen. It is a creation of fear that is not necessary. Let's talk about what really is real right now. Your heart's beating right now. Does your heart care about how much or how little money you have? Does your heart care about what happened in the past? Ask it right now. Ask the space around your heart about anything in the world you're worrying about. Think about it and close your eyes. I want to offer you guys to close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Release it. And think of anything that you're worried about. And tell the space that's beating your heart about it. And then listen to what the space that's beating your heart, the same space that's beating my heart, listen to what it says back. And if you have new fears show up, like, I don't know if I'm doing this right, or, you know, I don't think I get it, tell that to the space that's beating your heart. Anything you can come up with that's the illusion of a problem, tell the space that's beating your heart. And listen to what it says. If you have a yeah, but show up, tell that. Yeah, but what about, okay, tell that. And listen to what it says. I'm seeing a few tears show up because that's the releasing of the part of you that was trying to get love on a conditional level finally being seen by you in this moment right now. That's what the crying actually is. That's the goodbye through the idea of being an actual space of unconditional love for the story that created struggle so that it could overcome it. Just curious if anyone had a thing that your heart said? Anyone want to yell out what it said? Yes? Um, that I won't be able to finish my book. That's what your heart said? Well, no, no, I said that. You said, I'm scared I won't be able to finish my children's book? I was like, your heart's, your heart's different than ours. Uh, <laughs> You won't be able to, like, I'm like, your heart's mean. Uh, yeah. So you're worried you won't be able to ch finish your children's book? I'm just worried. I have a deadline for tomorrow. You have a deadline for tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, and what'd your heart say? My heart said, it's okay. You know what to do, and we'll get it done tonight. It's okay, you'll know what to do. By the way, if you listen longer, your heart will say, also, if you don't, that's fine, too. That's right. That's right. Your heart will go, I love you no matter what. Right? Because it could be an arbitrary dad don't be mad at me deadline that you have going on. It could be a should deadline. But your heart actually says everything's fine. Either way, no matter what's going on, whatever, even if that thing happens, I love you all the way. That's what your heart actually says. And it, it's this place that I love to observe. I talked about this the last service, but I, I love it so much that I want to share it here. This place... Is it, it exists in our body, and whenever someone complains about something, they always say this really quickly and really passing by, just like it's not a major thing. They'll be complaining, and then he said this, and then they go, deep down I know everything's fine, but a bunch of complaining again. <laughs> deep down I know everything's fine, but... Here's where my problems are. Doesn't that sound a little addicted to the problems? Because you just said something about over here. Deep down, I know everything's fine. And some, for some reason, our society has decided to make deep down 
this kind of distant summer home that we just peek in the window for a second and then go back to our studio apartment that we live with seven billion other people that are worrying like crazy. Right? What if deep down is really awesome? What if deep down is a giant summer home and it has infinite masseuses and like hot tubs and crazy stuff? Professional cuddlers are in it and it's crazy. It's got 10,000 rooms in it and like only six people live there. Mr. Rogers, Michael Beckwith, Oprah Winfrey. Like these are the people that live in the deep down home, right? That's who lives in deep down, right? And if you listen to silence long enough, you start moving in. You like meet a realtor and they show you the key and how to open it and every once in a while. And then you might go through a few months of back and forth. Well, I kind of miss over here where I have all my problems and can worry a lot because I get a lot of connection and I'm going to, you know, be seen by the status quo as just enough and I don't have to, okay. But then over here, I'm going to lose a lot of what people think. I'm going to lose a lot of my parents' opinions. I'm going to transcend their opinions actually because deep down is so infinite. You can listen to silence more. Listen to silence more, and then eventually you stop saying deep down, I know everything's fine. You just say everything's fine. Because deep down is you. Deep down is you. Now, people hear these talks and they like it just enough in the mind to not go move to deep down. And I'm going to dare you to make this talk worth not what you paid for it, which is pretty little. And I'm going to dare you later to give to this insanely amazing church, spiritual center, group of people. I'm going to dare you to give beyond the level you're used to giving because that breaks the cap open on how big you can receive. Right? When you see yourself give beyond yourself, when you see yourself do this, like you give someone that you think this number would really throw them off, like if you gave a homeless person $100, you just broke the lid on how big you see that they can have, and so you do that for you. Yours pops open, right? Realize that you're a space of flow, right? So it's both true that how much you receive decides how much you give, and it's vice versa. How much you give decides how much you receive. So when you're in a place where you're giving... Give fully and realize you're the apple tree, not the apple. Because the same part of us that's hoarding our money is the same part of us hoarding million dollar ideas. Right? The same part of us. You're the apple tree. And the more you do this and let go of everything that doesn't align, the more you open up to receive, right? So it's just a side dare that I have for you to do something. But what I was going to say is when you leave here, make this talk not just worth the time you took to get here and whatever you end up donating. But make this talk worth what you do with it afterwards. Like this talk will mean so much more to me if you go home and you actually listen to the deep down space an hour or two a day for the next year. Like if you wake up and stop doing the old egoic things like watch the news, flip on Facebook and almost feel uncomfortable that you're not uncomfortable, Let yourself fall into the depths of what you are, and I'm going to dare you to actually do something with it so you start to embody the same deep downness that anyone that you appreciate or look at as a hero does, because they're just being an example for you of what you are. And you have this opportunity to leave this talk and become the example for everyone else of what they are by living it. We can't just tell other people to do it while we're not doing it. Potential butterflies love to prevent themselves from flying by telling caterpillars all over the place that they should fly. Like, if you're here, you have butterfly powers. If you came to this, there's a calling in you that says there's something bigger than what life taught me. Like, life taught me that you're supposed to work hard, get the thing, retire, which, by the way, if you do that with money, imagine if you did that with food. You can see how not natural that is. Like, imagine if you thought the way you eat You're supposed to go into the cheesecake factory and get as much food as possible stored in your body for the next 30 years, and then when you're 66, retire on your social security fat, and then stop eating completely. (laughs) That would be insane. But we're like, we got to get the money and put it away. We got to get the money and put it away for way later. And then we got to stop doing anything creative and stop making any money and then just use this for later. But if you're here, you know that that doesn't make any sense. So there's something in your body that's opening up, and that to me is what I call the butterfly. The butterfly 
you are moving based on intuition. That's how I move, based on feeling, right? I just decide instantly if something's supposed to be in my life. Does it expand my life or does it make me contracted? And I know I'm contracted if I come up with a justification to keep it, right? So for instance, I have a, thank you, both of you. I have a two-year-old daughter. (laughs) I have a two-year-old daughter named Vivian. She is so amazing. She's so cute. And I have never said, well, she gets good medical, so I'll let her keep being my daughter. Do you get what I'm saying? I've never said, well, she gets these benefits, so I think I'll keep her as my daughter. No, she's my daughter. I would never explain to anyone why I would keep this girl as my daughter. Same with what I do for a living. I love what I do. I'm never going to justify it to anybody. But we all know what it's like to be in a job we don't like and say, but eventually I'm going to get a raise. We know what it's like to be in a friendship with someone that doesn't feel like they align and go, yeah, but they did give me that one dinner that time and they were really nice, right? Right? When you're justifying something, that's you ignoring the fact that you're not listening to your body and you need to go into your head to make sense out of it. So if you keep it in your life, you have to stay in your head. If you keep the thing in your life that doesn't align with your soul, you have to stay in your head. And these things that are trying to expand you are a preview because we have those first two voices, right? There's a first voice that shows up in every decision we make. And it shows up and it feels good and you got about three seconds with it. Or it shows up and it says something like, what if we left this company? It just shows up on the side. What if we asked that person, what if we just flew to Italy right now? Like it's showing up in my body. What if we write a book? That's the first voice that shows up. And then right there, that's like a portal to you stepping into a whole new energy. And it can't tell you why because you've never done it. So it's actually asking you to move based on faith. So if you try to make sense out of it, you can only make sense based on your old story. So you go into your head as the way to get out of it. So the first voice shows up, what if we do this thing? What if we leave this company? And then the second voice shows up, and that's your yeah, but. So new story birthing, old story trying to stay alive, right? What if we do this thing? And then you come up with the stupidest reason over here why you shouldn't. (laughs) And we listen to that more. It'll be like, what if we leave this company? Yeah, but if we do, we can't go to that Black Angus party next week and they're they have free salad they're they're going to be giving up free salad and the first voice can't tell you this because it wants you to move based on faith and and your soul and learn what will happen once you say yes to it but it's like dude if you listen to me you could own all the black anguses in a month and you could make them all vegan if you wanted and then the and then the second voice is like yeah but they have those potatoes and it's so good If you've ever stayed in a relationship that you know you don't want to be in because you know that the two of you eventually are going to be going camping, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Well, I don't like this person, but we already got the tent. So I'll not like being with them for the next two months, and then I'll hate them in the woods. Like, that's not what you want to do. And I've learned to follow the feeling, and it's really getting specific, and it's testing me now. And a few years ago, before I had my amazing daughter, I I saw a poster of one of my old performances. There's a poster I had framed in a closet, and it was from my Comedy Central years, and it was a number one Comedy Central special. I pulled it off, and I asked my body, do I want to keep this? And my body was feeling heavy with it, but my mind came up with a reason. I said, if I ever have a kid, I'm going to want to show them this thing. And my body was like, yeah, I want to let go of it, but my mind was explaining to myself, keep it. But my body wanted to let go of it. Your body is telling you. So I walk over, I I feel it. I don't want to keep this, actually. My soul doesn't want to keep this. This story, this thing that was me. So I walk over to a dumpster, and I let go of it, and it shatters in the dumpster, which, like, made it official. I was like, oh, cool. Like... And then I walked away and I felt this lightness and a voice go, your kid would rather have you as a present father. Your kid needs your presence. She doesn't need me going, look what I did in 2007. Aren't you proud of me? Don't you like me? Because that's kind of chasing people's approval. But once you let go of the thing that your mind was keeping, you have to go into your body. You have to go into your heart. And then you cry for a minute because your mind is not needed. Your old story isn't needed for a second. And the way the ego works is it loves to create a problem so that it can overcome it. 
Your ego likes to find what's wrong so that it can overcome what it created in the first place. And that's why we stay with things that don't align with our soul. If I ask you right now on a scale of 1 to 10, what does meditating feel like to you? What shows up in your body? Anyone? 10. It's a 10 for me. Now, if I said to you on a scale of 1 to 10, what does flipping through Facebook feel like to you? I mean, like 70 times a day. What does that feel like? Is that a 10? No. Yet many of us do it. So we live in a two or a three. And if you're doing that, life can't come in. The truth of what you are can't come in. And by the way, abundance can't come in because your old story says you're worth so much less. Think about, up until this talk, how you unconsciously think about money. Think about how you think about money. Do you think it's never enough? I wish it was more. Or do you have some deep-rooted conditioning with your family that says something like, money doesn't grow on trees, or it's the root of all evil, right? Now I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you're money, and you're on a date with you. You're on a date. Would you like to be on a date with someone that says you're never enough? You need to be more. You're the root of all evil. You want to hang out with that person? What would you want if you were on a date with someone? You'd probably want them to love you as you are. You'd probably want them to actually make their best connection to themselves. Right? Their best connection has to be themselves because then they're a safe space for you whether you're in your darkness, whether you're in your doubt. So I want to ask you if that's the case, then can you look at your bank account even if it's at a negative and go, I love it exactly where it is. Because in the old paradigm, we've been taught to think positive. And that's awesome, and there's so many great things about that, but that implies there's a negative. And I find that my light is not measured by how much I keep staying in the light. It's measured by how much of my darkness, which is only my judgment, that I fall in love with. So if you want to actually become abundant, fall in love with being broke. If you want to have a good relationship, fall in love with being alone and single. If you want to have a good life, embrace the idea that death is a part of life and watch how good it becomes, right? Just in saying some unconscious sentence like money equals security or money equals freedom, you're saying the biggest lie ever and that's that I don't equal security. I don't equal freedom. You're the source of every dollar you've made. Get excited about you. Get excited about you. Wouldn't it be weird if we went for a walk in the woods and I rounded a corner and you didn't see me and I find this giant waterfall just, and I just get a cup of water and I come running back and you didn't see the waterfall and I go, look everyone, a cup of water. <laughs> One cup of water. Look everyone, a cup of water. Isn't this amazing? This cup of water and you're looking at this limited cup and you're immediately seeing lack because it's going to be gone very soon and you're going, man, I hope I can get the rent paid with this water and I hope that I... But you don't know that around the corner is a waterfall. You're the space that every dollar came from. You're the space. You've never got to see... We've never got to see what life's like if we start to focus on the space and then trust that it might go, I'm going to let, if you want this thing, I'm going to actually let go of your attachment to the thing. I'm going to make you actually lose the thing that you want first so that you can fall apart and see that you're still alive. Yeah. There was a lady that came up to me at the last talk and she said, your talk touched me because we lost millions this week. And I was like, thank God, because now you can access the infinite part of you that's worth billions. Yeah. Right? And when you have that, you can invest it in your creativity and you can donate it and you can be a space of love for the world and you can do your thing. It's available for you, for real. It really is. So I have my book, The Illusion of Money, that's going to be in the bookstore in the back. And I, I did make a joke about being honored to be here. It is, in 2006, I came to Agape for the first time and I had a very awesome Comedy Central career and this hit my body so much more and it's emotional for me to be here even though I've had so many other gigs this gig is so 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 touching and this I know I've spoken at Agape many times but I haven't been the he's the speaker this time 
And, and it's been something I've been focusing on and honored to be with you. And I want to thank you so much for having me, Agape. Thank you for being with me. Thank you to Reverend Michael Beckwith for changing my entire life. Thank you to all of Agape. Thank you for being here. I'll be in the back. Please give to Agape. Donate like you've never done it. And then open up and watch what happens. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you.